So last week we, we left off looking at um, how the, the power of the cross secures our shared oneness together. We've been trekking through the book of Ephesians, taking it verse by verse, and, and just really kind of narrowing in on the, the themes that we see um, that, that Paul kind of reveals to us in this, this passage of Scripture. Um, and where we left off last week is he is addressing, and very practically, right, where it kind of speaks to our culture today, he's addressing the spiritual and the racial and the cultural divide that existed between the Jews and the Gentiles in chapter two, right? So the, the, Jews, the Jews considered the Gentiles a bunch of dogs. I mean, not like, could you imagine like, you know, I mean, trying to, these are the people who were in their churches, right? All of a sudden, like this is how the Jews viewed the Gentiles. Like they were just a bunch of dogs. There was hostility that existed clearly amongst the Jews and the Gentiles. And it was a hostility that existed for, for many, many years. You see, the Jews saw themselves as God's chosen and privileged people. And there was no room in their theology for anybody else at the table other than Jews. And so now into their tribe starts walking in these Gentiles who have embraced Christ. These Gentiles who in their mind, they viewed them as a bunch of dogs. And it created a divide. It created a, a hostile environment. The Jews, on the other hand, saw what they considered in the, the, in the Jews a, a, a very pharisaical, elitist group of people. They saw the Jews as, as people. I mean, I mean, honestly, if the Jews viewed them as dogs, obviously the Gentiles were thinking they think they're better than we are. They're, they refer to us as a bunch of dogs, right? And it doesn't take long to start to feel like when people are looking down at you, right? What a great lesson for us to learn today. That we need to be really careful that we recognize that the only difference between us and anybody else is Jesus Christ, right? The ground before the cross is level. And the most vile of sinners is no less valuable than we are. The difference between us and the most vile of sinner is Jesus Christ. And so we got this audience of people, the Jews and the Gentiles, this hostility that exists. And we start seeing now that the Gentiles are hearing about faith in Christ. And, and now they're, they're pulling away from their, their pagan backgrounds, right? And their religious systems. And they're embracing Christ. And they're entering into the church. And then you've got the Jews who had been around the system. They were, they were the religious group of people, but they hadn't embraced Christ yet. And so they start embracing this message and realizing that that which they taught was pointing them to the fulfiller who would come, the person of Jesus Christ. Their Messiah had arrived. And so we start seeing that in the church, there's an exist, that we, in, in the church exist these Jews and these Gentiles. These Gentiles were those who were considered far from God, and the Jews were those who were considered near God. Not near in the sense that they cross over the line into salvation, but they were the moral ones. They were the ones that knew the right things to say and to do. They had the, the pedigree from the past, right? That was acceptable, right? They were the moralist of the day. But then you got the pagans coming in and they're a messy people, right? They're coming with all kinds of pagan practices and sinful lifestyles, right? And so they were the ones who were far off. And then you've got the Jews, those who were kind of near and then they're still now in the same building. And Paul addresses that group of people. And he says, and he came, verse, uh, chapter two and verse 17, Paul says, and he, speaking of Christ, he came and preached peace to you who were far off, those were the Gentiles, and peace to those who were near, those were the Jews. They were close to it, they just weren't in. For through him, through Christ, not not their Gentile or Jewish heritage, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. 
now in this audience of people, Jew and Gentile alike, through Christ, we are one. We are one. He calls them, how in the world, he, he, how in the world do you get this group of people to begin to view one another according to their own identity? I mentioned last week that Paul highlights to them that this amazing work of God that is done in each of these groups was done by the grace of God and the grace of God alone, right? There was nothing they did. There was no effort or any, um, anything they did to initiate this. This was by the grace of God, not of works, lest anybody should boast. That is why they were in this audience together. But the problem was they had no, they had no problem getting, seeing themselves in this company. They just are having a hard time seeing one another in this company. And so how does Paul instruct them on, on the proper way of viewing people who were different than them? He calls them to remember. He says, remember what you were like before you came. Remember what sin you were involved in. Don't forget your past, right? Don't live in it. Don't dwell in it. But don't forget where you came from. That before Christ stepped in, you were a train wreck on your way to hell too, right? And when we understand that and we recognize that the only reason that we can come into the presence of God is through the grace of God, it causes a tremendous love and appreciation for what God has done for us, but it also creates a tremendous tolerance for other people who aren't like us. He says, remember what you were. Remember, he says, remember you were separated from Christ. Remember you were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. Remember that you were strangers to the covenant of promise. Remember that you were without hope and without God in the world. Don't forget where you were. Don't forget the, the path that you were heading towards. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together in Christ. Right? By grace, we've been saved. He said, remember that so you can appreciate what God has done for you and you can appreciate what God has done for one another. And you see, if we could do it, if we could do it for the Jews... He could do it for the Gentiles. These two groups come together as one people by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He says in verse 14, for he himself is our peace who has made us both Jew and Gentile, religious background and pagan background. He made us both one and he's broken down in his flesh, the dividing wall of hostility. That's what the cross of Christ does. It unites that which was once divided. It knocks down the wall of hostility that exists between me and Father because of my sin, but it also knocks down the wall of hostility that naturally exists amongst people. You see, there should never be division within the body of Christ. We should never define one another by the, the color of our skin, by our socioeconomic background, by the environment or the neighborhood we grew up in. I mean, that, that's, the, that's the outworking, that's the, that's the practical application of what Paul is addressing to our day today. It took this gospel, it takes the Jews and the Gentiles, once divided, and makes them one. Now, as we come to chapter three, Paul will continue to build on the nature of the church, the beauty of the church, the body of Christ, this, the character of, of one people in Christ, these two that have become one. But before he does that, he, he gets to, before he makes that point, he communicates the qualifications that he has for delivering the message. You see, you gotta understand, we read this and we kinda, we, we have a lot of years between us and when this was written, right? And so for us to kinda, we hear that, we, we think, of course that, that sounds good, but this was, this was coming to people um, fresh and new in the church at Ephesus. They never heard of anything like this. You mean we need to embrace Jew and Gentile? Like this was coming as a bunch of, of new information. Like, Paul, who do you think you are? Where are you getting this information from? 
And so Paul is needing to say, listen, let me just, let me, this just wasn't an idea I had sitting in the bathroom one day, right? He will kind of, he will bring some qualification as to why and what he's about to say as he opens up in chapter three. He says, look, he says, for this reason, based on what we kind of talked about, this whole two becoming one, for this reason, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, on behalf of you Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. Listen to what Paul is saying here. He's saying, listen, he's a prisoner of Christ, right? He, Paul, Paul's writing this from a prison cell and he's, right, he's in a prison cell for their benefit. And he says, I'm assuming that you've heard of the stewardship of God's grace. In other words, I'm sure you've heard how God has entrusted me with a special revelation for your sake, for your good. God himself has given me something special, miraculous. A mystery has been revealed to me for you. Now, if anybody comes up and says that to you today, that, that you, you need to question that, right? But, but this, this, is, this is the apostle Paul. And Paul's like, God has shown me something and it's for you. Like many of Paul's epistles, he is writing them from a, a prison cell. He is imprisoned for his faith and he's giving nothing, he's giving nothing but the, the time in that prison cell to write. I just think there's just something very significant about that. I mean, this is the Apostle Paul. This is a guy who was a type A driven mover and shaker change agent, right? I mean, we see his ministry that is spread all throughout the New Testament. We see a tremendous powerhouse in, 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 the, in the Apostle Paul, and here he is in a prison cell, a place that he often frequented, by the way, because of his preaching of the gospel and for his faith. Do you see the wisdom of God in how what would appear to be something that would slow down the ministry of the Apostle Paul, right? Something that would appear to be, uh, make him a little bit less effective, right? I mean, you've got a guy like that. It's like, turn him loose, man. Let, let him go to the far ends of the earth and bring the gospel. And God's like, no, what we're gonna do with Paul is we're gonna place him in a prison cell. Because as Paul is in this prison cell, he is writing letters we call him the book of Ephesians. We call him the book of Colossians. We call him the book of Philippians. We call him the book of Galatians. You see, what Paul, what God was doing with the apostle Paul is was setting him aside for kingdom purposes that went far beyond the temporary audience to whom he was writing. And here we are in the church some 2,000 years later reading the revelation that God had given the apostle Paul. Now, what does that tell you about your setback? I mean, there are times where God will bring a season into your life where it just seems like things slow down a lot, where you feel lonely, where it feels like nobody wants to talk to you, nobody wants to be around, now, if, every, if nobody wants to be around you, there's probably something wrong. You need to kind of do a little self-assessment and see what's going on, right? But, but there are seasons where you kind of feel like, why, why am I finding myself alone so much? Maybe, just maybe, God is creating an environment for you to spend some more time alone with him. I mean, Paul could have been like, really? Back in prison again? Don't you realize what I can do? No, Paul, don't you realize what I'm doing? Paul's ministry is continuing to speak today, even though he's dead. And so we need to remember that what appears to be a setback very well may be a setup for the next step of God working in your life 
and God working through you in the lives of others. Because that's what we saw taking place in the Apostle Paul. Paul is writing to them and saying to them, listen, I'm writing here from a prison cell. I'm a prisoner for Christ. But he says, look, I'm a prisoner for Christ on your behalf. I'm not here for me. I'm here for you Gentiles. In other words, my imprisonment is actually, it's a gift to you Gentiles. Perhaps because of Paul's makeup, perhaps if Paul wasn't forced to slow down, he would have never taken the moment of pause to write these letters. I don't know. But what Paul does recognize is his imprisonment was not for him. It was for them. And that's what catapulted the truth of God to be spread across the churches. This setup, this, this setback clearly was a setup. Look what he says in verse three. He says, and while here, he says, how, he says, have you heard about how this mystery was made known to me by revelation? As I have written briefly, this mystery. Four times in this section of scripture that we're gonna look at today, Paul will make reference to this, this mystery. What is this mystery that Paul will make reference to? I'll unpack just what this, this mystery is this morning and I pray, celebrate God has done in the church. Look with me in verse four. First he says, how this mystery was made known to me by Revelation verse three, as I have written briefly. When verse four, when you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations. Nobody else knew this in earlier generations, but God has made known this mystery to me. You've heard, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which, which, which was not made known to the sons of men in other generations, as it has now been revealed to his holy po- apostles and prophets by the spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. What's Paul saying here? He's saying that in times past, the the people of God with, with their systems and their promises of what was going to come and the, the prophecies and, and their prophets, they, they heard that something was coming. They heard that change was on the horizon. They knew that there was a Messiah coming. They knew that there was a people of God that was going to exist in a very different way than anything that they had experienced. They just didn't know exactly how it was going to play out. It was a mystery to them. So many of them were crushed when Christ was crucified and died on the cross. Why? Because this mystery that they didn't understand, now Jesus shows up on the scene, right? And he starts healing the sick and raising the dead and casting out demons. And we start seeing the ministry of Jesus going forward. And they're like, wow, he is finally here. Our Messiah has come. He is going to now our guy, right? A Jew has arrived on the scene and he's going to be our deliverer. This is what we've been waiting for. He's going to set up his kingdom right here and right now. And we, as the Jewish people, we're going to rule and reign with him. What do you mean he's going to a cross? What do you mean he died? They were crushed because their plan was not fulfilled. This mystery left them perplexed. In fact, it wasn't until the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter two, following the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, that this new covenant that Jeremiah prophesied about was ushered into the church. Up until that point, they had no idea that the Holy Spirit that would at times in the past descend upon a specific one or two people, but now this Holy Spirit would abide within the people of God. All people who have embraced the Son point to Christ as the central person of our redemption. They didn't know. This mystery wasn't revealed to them. This mystery, Paul defines for us what this mystery is in, in verse six. 
It's interesting, in verse 4, he says that he was given insight into the mystery of Christ, of Christ. And then he says in verse 6, he defines this mystery. He says, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body. They are partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. It is a reiteration of what he had been saying earlier about the Jews and the Gentiles becoming one. But there is more to it than that, and we're going to get into that in a moment. But it's this oneness that out of the two comes one. Now, now for you and for me, all these years later, again, it doesn't appear to be that big of a deal. I mean, obviously, we've got 2,000 years of hindsight to look and see how that played out. But for them, this was kind of new. This was like new information. And Paul is addressing these people who were hostile towards one another, right? There was a wall of separation between Jew and Gentile. And he says here, this mystery is that the Jews and the, and the Gentiles are going to be fellow heirs, are you kidding me? Fellow, like equal? Like not even like, we're not even gonna be a little bit above them? I mean, when did these Gentiles step onto the scene? They weren't there during the, you know, as they walked through the Red Sea. It wasn't them who followed the cloud by day and the fire by night. Why in the world would these Gentiles? And how in the world can these Gentiles, these pagans, these people who were against God, how can we be fellow heirs together? Paul says it's a mystery how these two can become one. We can't underestimate how the cross changes everything. The cross of Christ changes everything, even the way in which we relate to one another. Look further. Paul says, of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace. This grace which was given to me by the working of his power. To me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given. I just love the humility, the genuine humility of the Apostle Paul. He, this wasn't something he had to say. This is something he truly was aware of. He you see, the closer you, the closer you get to God, the more aware you are of how much in your own, by your own merits you don't belong there. It's, it's the immature believer who thinks that they can just have a very ho-hum relationship with the Almighty. But the closer we get to his face, the more in awe we are of him. And the more like Isaiah, we say, woe is me for I am, I am undone. I don't belong here, but by the grace of God. He says to me, though I'm the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. Paul said, I don't, I don't deserve to be the delivery boy of this message. For reasons I'll never understand on this side of eternity, I, who am the least of the saints, have been entrusted with the revelation of this mystery, that Jew and Gentile are made one in Christ. You see, the mystery is more than just the fact that Jews and Gentiles are one. I mean, that's, that's a big deal. But the real mystery is how that happened. How are they made one? How does God take the religious community and the pagan community and make them one without violating or compromising his holiness without lowering his standards. He is immutable. He is a God who does not change. How does a holy God allow into his audience imperfect, sinful people, those who are far off 
who don't belong in, as well as those who were near who didn't belong either. How does God allow into his presence sinful people without lowering his standard, without compromising his holiness, without changing his nature? How in the world does God do that? I've got some got some coins in my pocket. And uh, all different. I've got a couple quarters and nickels, dimes, some pennies. This, qu- this quarter here, you know, by, by the standards of the world, these coins, while they're all coins, they have different value. Few people, I mean, there used to be a day when people would bend down to pick up a dime. Usually they don't pick up dimes anymore. They, they, sometimes they'll stop at a quarter, um, right? But rarely, I mean, people throw pennies away, right? I mean, it doesn't have the value as, as much as a quarter or a nickel does. See, we, we assess the value of the coin by what it can do for us. And so we have, so I have these coins here, and, and there's this quarter here that this quarter is still shiny and it's fairly new. It doesn't have much history. Um, it's one of those newer quarters, and, and I don't know where it's been and whose hands it's been in, but, but it really hasn't got around very much. It's been, it's been pretty, it's kind of pure in one sense. I got, but I got this nickel here. This nickel is about, I think this is the one that's about 50 years old. It's filthy and dirty and mildewy and moldy. I don't know where it's been. It, for you germaphobes, I don't know where it's been. I mean, this nickel's got some history. Maybe this is a part of uh, some sinful activity. I don't know. Maybe it was a part of good activity. It's got a story, though, that makes me wonder where it's been and whose hands it's passed from. I should probably wash my mouth out with soap now. <laughs> I've got this other nickel. This, this, this nickel is shiny, but this is from, from Canada, probably one of the trips that I went on camping. This one's from far away from America, right? So I don't know its story. I don't know where it came from. I don't know where it's going. I don't even know the, the full value of what this really is. It's probably not worth very much. I've got a couple of pennies. I've got some shiny ones and some dark, some dark dirty ones. And, but you see, these coins have all got a story. These coins have all got a past. And you know what the reality of it is? They all have different pasts. They all have different stories. And they all have different values in the eyes of the world. And they've all engaged in different activity. You know where I'm going with this, right? And so really, this coin, it represents you and me. We've got different pasts. We've got different experiences. We've engaged in different sinful activity and good good things and bad things. And and we all come from different places. And and now we all kind of come together in church, right? You see, how does God take this, these filthy coins that, that, that represent so much sinful activity and, and how does God allow us into his presence? How does a holy God allow unholy people into his presence without lowering his standard, without changing that which is holy? How in the world does God take that which is dirty and make it right and acceptable and valuable. He he puts us in Christ. And you see, in Christ, there's only one value of this envelope now. All of its individuality is lost in Christ. And you see, in the end of the day, this is the union that we have in Christ. Our past is no more. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, right? And so now we are in Christ, Jew and Gentile, sinner and saint, right? 
pagan and religious person now coming into the presence of God. And what Paul is highlighting for the church is such were some of you. Some of you were pagans that were far away. Some of you were Jews that were close up. But here's the power of the cross. Now in Christ, we have shared value. This is the mystery. How in the world? You see, the prophets of old, the systems of the old, the priests of the old, the preachers of the old looked forward at what was going to be, and they thought, how in the world is God going to do that? It is a mystery to us. And Paul says, for reasons I'll never understand, God has revealed to me this mystery. Here's how it happens. You are in Christ. No longer Nickels, dimes, pennies, quarters, Jews, Greeks, sinners, your past, your shame, your guilt, your fear, it's washed away. And we are in Christ. This mystery revealed. Please don't take for granted that which was freely provided for you in Christ. Don't make light of who you are. And don't make light of one another. You're in Christ. That's the mystery. The union that the church has with Christ and the union that we have with one another is perhaps one of the most understated realities in all of Christendom. You see, we, we must understand who we are in Christ. When we understand who we are in Christ, we start to see ourselves as God sees us. And we start seeing one another as God designed for us to see one another how God can take an imperfect people and make them worthy to stand before the presence of his glory without compromising his holiness is nothing short than miraculous. But it is in Christ that is done. And so the mystery is how the two became one, but even more, how they became one. Paul goes on to say, and to bring, this took, this took place, and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery, this mystery that's been hidden for ages in God. This God who created all things, look, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Do you see what he says here? This mystery is to bring, it brings to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery, the plan of salvation for all ages so that through the church the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through one another, through your story, through your past, through your failures, through your mistakes, through your sinfulness, you've been invited to the table in an audience with God. This mystery is revealed in Christ. It's a very powerful statement that Paul is making. Not only is Paul blown away by the, the revelation of, of our union with God in Christ, not only ought the church to be blown away by our union in Christ, but look what Paul says, even the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places, who's that? That's the angels. The angels of God as well as the fallen angels that are awaiting judgment. They look at the church and they see the wisdom of God revealed and saying, wow, that, you see, 
the angels aren't omniscient. They, they are not all knowing. They, like you and me, we, they learn, right? They observe, they watch. And for ages past, they heard and they got a glimpse of what it might look like. But the question was, how in the world are you going to do this, God? And then Paul says, here's the, here's the deal. Here's the mystery of God. It's revealed through the church and the angels go, wow, look what God has done. Look what God has done. Peter, in speaking of this great salvation that we have been recipients, will also make note of that as well when he talks about in 1 Peter chapter 1, he says concerning this salvation that we've been recipients of, he said the prophets who prophesied about the grace that is going to be ours, they searched and inquired carefully. They tried to understand that they had no idea how in the world God was going to do what they were prophesying God would do. And then they came to the realization that really it wasn't for them, but it was for you and for me. And then he says here in verse 12, these are truths that even the angels look to understand. In Revelation, where it talks about how the angels will stand before and just cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Maybe the reason they're doing that is they recognize that they are in an audience of redeemed people as well, who they know do not belong there because of their own, their own works. And they look and see what God has done. And they look at a redeemed group of people who formerly were not a people, but now are the people of God. And they look and say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This mystery revealed in us. Paul wraps up this thought by, by saying this, this was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through our faith in him. Wow. We who can't even stand before God now have access. We have boldness, access with confidence. You ever walk up to somebody that, 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 that really intimidates you? Can I just tell you, don't ever let anybody ever intimidate you. Yes. Nobody should ever, ever intimidate. Nobody is, if you can have an audience with God, what is man? Don't ever let anybody intimidate you. But because of the cross, because of what Christ has done, because of this union that we have in Christ, we have boldness and access to him with confidence through faith in him. And so he says, so I ask you, do not lose heart. Again, remember, he's giving a report of how he's doing in prison, right? And he's like, listen, don't get discouraged over the fact that I'm in prison. Don't lose heart over where I am because I'm suffering for you, which is for your glory. It's for your good. The kingdom of God is going forward. What should be our response to these things? As we look at Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians chapter two, and Ephesians chapter three, we see that Paul over and over again, and in many ways, is highlighting who we are in Christ. Where do you go from there? How do we see ourselves as a result of, of, of our identity in Christ? What do we do? And how do we see one another in light of the fact that we're all in Christ. How then shall I live? What ought my posture to be based on what God says about me? I mentioned earlier the first three chapters, one, two, and three, deal with our position in Christ. It's the what. Chapters four, five, and six will deal with our practices. 
how our position will inform how we ought to live. Chapters one, two, and three is the what. And chapters four, five, and six is the so what. How then shall we live in light of what God says for us? And that is the, that is the stage that Paul is beginning to set. The what moves towards the so what. How then shall I live in light of who I am in Christ? And that's what we're going to pick up next week. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for what it says about us. Thank you that it is so much more than just theory. It is reality. God, I pray that you would do what I could never do, that you would take these truths and cause them to go deep into the hearts of every person that's listening to them and that the fruit would abound, that each and every person would see themselves as you see them in Christ with one another, the two now one, accepted in the beloved, having access with confidence, never being turned away because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for these truths. Thank you for the grace of God in our lives. In Christ's name we pray.